Today is Palm Sunday, and that means that it is the start of Holy Week. It's one of the most festive times of the year for Christians all around the world. It's during Holy Week that Jesus is going to walk to Jerusalem day after day to teach and to debate, to preach and to heal the sick. And then he will walk back to Bethany in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Each and every day he will cross over the Mount of Olives. This is significant because the prophets foretold that the Christ would come as a divine warrior king and he would stand on the Mount of Olives. They said, the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. To be clear, Jesus was the divine warrior king that was in view, but he was not the divine warrior king in the way that most people imagined he would be. Jesus did not come to lead a revolt with swords and spears against the Roman Empire. He came to wage a cosmic war against the world, the flesh, and the devil by laying down his life at the cross. His kingdom is not of this world. The crowds didn't know it yet, but Jesus is not going to meet their expectations. He is not going to satisfy their political ambitions. He's not going to make Jerusalem great again. He's going to turn the world upside down. And all of that starts by Jesus mounting the colt of a donkey and riding that colt into Jerusalem. A colt of a donkey, not a war horse. Unlike the worldly kings who flaunt their glory and power and ride out with SUVs and bulletproof glass and lord it over the masses, King Jesus rides into a town on the beast of burden. He comes with meekness and humility, not with arrogance and pride. And why does he come on the colt of a donkey? There are all kinds of theories, all kinds of reasons that you can discover. Pastors and scholars have limitless imagination. And yet, the Spirit of God tells us specifically that it was simply to fulfill what God's Word spoke by the prophets. Behold, your King is coming to you, His righteousness, and He has salvation. He is humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem, many spread their cloaks on the road in front of him. The other gospel writers tell us that people spread leafy branches as well, branches they had cut from the fields. So those who went before and those who came after were shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. If this song sounds familiar to you, it is because this song echoes the song that the angels sang to the shepherds on the night Jesus was born. Remember, suddenly there was an angelic multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. Well, on the surface, all of this looks and sounds like a victory parade. The crowds and the people cheering and singing, rolling out the red carpet in front of Jesus, laying out palm branches and cloaks for him to ride upon. It sounds and looks like a victory parade to everyone except the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to more fully appreciate what's happening in this story, I want to share with you a bit of Jewish history. Knowing the socio-political circumstances and context of the palm branches will help put some things in perspective. About 200 years before Jesus mounted that colt and rode up into Jerusalem, the Jews had revolted against the Greeks and they drove out of their city Antiochus Epiphanes out of Jerusalem and they cleansed the temple and in celebration and commemoration of that great victory, the Jews marched around the city of Jerusalem waving palm branches 
And so the palm branch became a popular symbol of national pride and patriotism. It's easy to read a story like this and to imagine that it was simply some sort of spontaneous worship service. And you might conclude that because you hear all of this biblical imagery and you see all of this religious exercise. But make no mistake that what's happening here is a politically charged event aimed at sticking it to the Roman Empire. And by political event, I don't mean that it was some sort of liberal, hippie, Jesus people, make love, not war, peaceful protest march. This is no sit-in. It's more like a far right-wing, kill them all, let God sort them out, political rally. There's no love loss between the Jews and the Romans in Jesus' day. The Romans had invaded the land of Judah and occupied the homeland of the Jews. And the Jews felt very much like prisoners in their own country. They wanted to cast off the Roman oppressors. The palm branches were not symbols of love and peace. They were symbols of war. The crowd is signaling to the Jewish leaders and the political rulers That they wanted Jesus to be their military, political savior. And herein lies the problem. Like many American evangelicals, Jewish leaders often mixed politics and religion into a toxic brew. They wrapped their personal and spiritual hopes in the palm leaves of political zeal and activism not unlike the way many American evangelicals wrap their religious hopes in the flag of old glory. Sadly, historically, God's people have often sought political solutions to fix their spiritual problems. It is enough to make Jesus weep. And in fact, he did. When Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, Would that you, even you, had known on this day what makes for peace. And what were the things that made for peace? According to Zechariah the priest, the father of John the Baptist, these are the things that made for peace. The tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. What are the things that make for peace? The tender mercies of our God and the Son of God sent into the world as the Savior. But now, These things are hidden from your eyes. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because he knew that the window of salvation was closing and that the storm of condemnation was coming. He wept because the city of God's peace did not recognize God in the flesh and they rejected him as their king. Instead, she declared war on him. She would not turn away from her sins and trust her Savior. Rather than kiss the Son, she decided that she will kill him. It's been said that no one knows the thoughts of Jesus as he entered Jerusalem to face those turbulent days. That Jesus did not weep for himself, but only for others. For the city of Jerusalem, for the country of Judah. But I beg to differ. As we see Jesus riding up into the city with the crowd singing and cheering and rolling out the red carpet for him, the Spirit tells us that this man of sorrows, who was acquainted with grief, who was touched with the feeling of our infirmities, this man wept. Jesus wept. Like the prophets Elijah and Jeremiah, Jesus wept. Because he knew that evil was going to befall the people of Israel. Their fortresses were going to be set on fire. 
Their young men killed with the sword. Their little ones dashed to pieces on the ground. Their expectant mothers torn apart. Their walls surrounded and torn down to the ground. Not one stone left on another. Alas for the women and children in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Jesus wept because he saw the end of Jerusalem, the end of Judah. He saw the end of the world for them. Like the sinful woman who loved much because she was forgiven much, Jesus wept. And he shed enough tears on the road up into Jerusalem that he could have washed a grown man's feet. That's what it means that Jesus wept. Not just a little sobbing, not a few tears to wipe away from his eye, but streams of tears flowing from his heart and eyes. As God in the flesh, Jesus thought and felt what holy God thought and felt He also thought and felt what any holy man of God ought to think and feel in moments like this. As Jesus ascended into Jerusalem, into the serpent's lair, into the jaws of the dragon, the crucible of suffering and death, groans too deep for words flowed up from his soul and flooded his heart and filled his eyes. And think about the dissonance Think about the contrasts that on the outside, the crowds are cheering and singing, but on the inside, Jesus' heart is cracking and screaming. Like God speaking through the weeping prophet Jeremiah, we can imagine Jesus expressing the same words that Yahweh and Jeremiah expressed in these words and wails flooded with tears. Just imagine that in his spirit, as Jesus rides the colt of a donkey into the city, knowing the future, knowing what is about to befall the city, not simply befall him at the cross, that in his spirit, he weeps and he wails in these words. My anguish, My anguish, I writhe in pain on the walls of my heart. My heart is beating wildly. I cannot keep silent, for I hear the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, for my people are foolish. They know me not. How can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me. They've sworn by those who are not gods. When I filled them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the house of the rising sun. They acted like well-fed, lusty stallions, each one neighing for his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? From the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly. They have said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I said, stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient ways. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. But you said, we will not. Behold, I lay before this people stumbling blocks against which they shall stumble. Fathers and sons together, neighbors and friends shall perish My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. 
For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Oh, that my head were waters. In my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. For they proceed from evil to evil and they do not know me, declares the Lord. So I will take up weeping and wailing for the mountains and a lamentation for the pastures of the wilderness. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation because they have forsaken my law that I set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked according with it. And since you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride, my eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is taken captive. Oh, let my eyes run down with tears night and day and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound and a very grievous blow. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite. Until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees, my eyes cause me grief at the fate of all the daughters of my city. Jesus' heart was cracking and screaming on the inside while the crowds were singing and cheering on the outside. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because of her many sins and the devastating war that was coming upon her. And he weeps for our world for the same reasons because he takes no delight in the death of or the destruction of sinners. We believe that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead, and that confession of faith rose so easily off of our tongues. But think of what it means. It means that on that day, some will be mercifully protected and preserved by his grace, but others will be justly punished and perish in their sins. Why? Because Jesus is going to let them have it their own way and let them choose their own paths and let them live with the consequences of their decisions and actions. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they did not recognize the time of God's visitation. They did not welcome the day of salvation and did not accept his terms for peace. And so like Jerusalem, when the Lord comes, many will perish because they woke up and chose the violence of war over against the virtue of peace. They opted for the hard-earned wages of their works instead of the free gift of his grace. This year, Holy Week feels a bit heavier for some of us if not even a bit holier, perhaps more like it did for Jesus and the disciples. As we enter Holy Week, we do not want to make the mistake of engaging in triumphalistic celebrations in our worship services prematurely. Don't rush to the end. Nor should we use these services to escape reality and Pretend that the world conditions around us are not so bad, not so grim, not so dire. In reality, they are far worse than we dare to imagine. 
As we enter Holy Week, we need to do more than shake our heads and wring our hands and say the world is sick and crazy, that the city of man is broken and fallen apart. It is. It is all of that, but worse. So we need to grieve and mourn and wail with Christ our Lord over the demise of our world, over the death of our children, our communities, cities, our country, our cosmos. As we enter Holy Week, we need to see what Jesus saw and felt what Jesus felt as far as grace allows. And that means lamenting with him from the depths of our heart and soul. It means praying that your heart will be punctured and that the tears will come dripping, streaming, flooding from your soul through your eyes. As one Jewish scholar and mystic put it, lament is precisely that stage at which language suffers death in a truly tragic sense. Lament is a tragic discourse that finds expression not in language, but in silence, where the words run out and fail us. Lament descends beyond words into groans too deep for words and devolves into the silent weeping and wailing of our tears. In the words of priest and poet Malcolm Geit, this holy week has begun where Lent ends. In tears, tears of frustration, tears of lament, and for so many who have been cruelly bereaved, tears of grief. It's hard to see through the tears, but sometimes it's the only way to see. But tears may be the turning point, the springs of renewal. To know that you have been wept for is to know that you are loved to know that you have been wept for is to know that you have a God who weeps for you, who weeps with you, who understands the depths and from the inside understands the tears of things. Brothers and sisters, behold your king. He comes not on a war horse to fight against you, but on a donkey to bear your burdens to carry you home. So lift up the gates of your hearts. Let the King of glory come in. Lift up your face, for light dawns on the righteous. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in your tender love for us, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature, to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and come to share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.